after that game, there was a bunch of controversy going on about horns down and how mad that made Rodney Terry. I still think that's the softest thing in the world to to go try and coach another man's team about, oh, mm-hmm. we don't do that here. That's, there is no we. We just kicked your ass in your own building. Like, if you're worried about us throwing horns down, then don't lose. The people in the South are insane. So I don't Crazy. know how they're going to fare with that. We're going to get shit if UCF comes into Lawrence and beats our ass. Do you think Coach Self's going to sit there and go talk to the AD and be like, you know how unacceptable that is? No, no one's going to say anything. It, it was a complete joke. It was so soft. And hey, yeah, if you don't want the horns down to be thrown, then don't lose a game because it's coming. Dad used to tell me all the time. He used to tell me all the time. Son, don't worry about the mules. Just load the wagon. College football tees, college basketball tees, whatever you need, Mercury has you covered with the best merch out there. We're talking about high quality clothing, inexpensive, and the best part is I have a 15% discount for everybody who goes and gets some right now. Use the code below, hit the link in the description, and go get your merch now. Use the code to get 15% off. What are you waiting on? Go do it. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rock Chalk Unplugged. I'm your host, Mitch Lightfoot, here with my co-host, Chris Tehan. It is a beautiful Monday here. I'm coming to you live from Belgium, but a uh, day after the Chiefs clinched the uh, Lamar Hunt Trophy, it, it was a, a great day for for both Chiefs fans in this in this podcast. We're excited. I'm repping my I'm repping my Patrick Mahomes, uh, the greatest to ever do it. As long as he's on the field, uh, Chiefs have always got a chance. So, Chris. Uh, let's get it started. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the state of Kansas basketball. I know there's been some com- controversy. Uh, we've lost some games, some road games. Uh, what do you What do you see there, and what What, what do we need to do in order to, to to get right get right on the right on the right path? You know what, Mitch? It, what I'm thinking about it, it's it's kind of like looking outside today. Hey, it's a sunny day. The sun came up. We 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 live to fight another day. It's a very very long season. Obviously, these losses early on are something we're not used to seeing as Kansas fans, which is great. You know, it's like we've been so good and so spoiled that it always is like the world is ending after these losses. And the first two are bad. They aren't. They aren't. Those aren't two good ones that you want to lose. The Iowa State ones a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more understandable you're going into Ames a Saturday on CBS I mean if you look at our record and against the spread or just in general wins and losses on CBS on a Saturday can't be good Nothing. can't be good but yeah that's a that's a trap game Ames Hilton is popping this year it's it's back to the old glory it had in the early 2010s and late 2000s so it's something that hey I'm not too down on everybody I do think there's some things that me and you need to address coming from co- former Kansas basketball players who kind of lived this and lived these struggles and we've been through it five times where hey there's been a point in the year where everyone's calling for either coach self's head or we're calling for hey we don't need to start Juan at point anymore they're always finding an excuse to kind of put blame on the things but in reality it's a very early season we don't want to peak right now would you rather start nine and zero and go four and three in the last seven games. I think it's the other way around. You'd rather go four and three and then go on a nice little run here at the end. So I'm not too worried about it, but let's start out by kind of getting into the good that's been going on lately. Cause in between those losses, there's been some impressive wins. What is kind of your thought on, Hey, look at the Oklahoma game. Look at the Cincinnati game and two games that we kind of had to grind it out. Oklahoma, we played well, but since he was another team, I mean, Cincinnati is great and they match up like we did against UCF. Very, very hard matchup, a lot of length. And we ended up being able to pull that one out with some big plays out of people that you wouldn't really expect it. So what yeah, is no, what is I, I, no I, I think you're hundred percent right. I think there's, there's been definitely bright spots on the year. There's no doubt about that. I think coach coach self talked about it after, after this past game at, at Iowa state, or we can beat everybody, but also at the same point in time, we've shown that that everybody can beat us. So that yep. there's a there's definitely th- some things we need to shore up there. Uh, I've I've seen fans that are that are quite upset about the fact that we are are giving up threes at, at the at the clip that we are, uh, and I think that that's something that fans have always been upset about. Whenever you pack yep. the paint, whenever you're whenever you're jumping in driving lanes and and preventing guys from getting into the into the paint, so. I can I can understand what they're saying, but at the same point in time, you have to take something away. If you're going to give something up, uh, you're going to give up a, a three that's it's a contested shot uh, to a team or to a guy that that scouting report says, "Hey, this guy isn't going to make sixty percent of those." 
it feels like to Kansas fans and, and to us that every time we say, hey, this guy isn't a great shooter, he's going to go out there and knock down three in a row and, and give his team a run and make us have to call a timeout. So so I understand, I understand where they're coming from, but my bright spot so far – has been really the emergence of, of Johnny Furphy. The guy, the guys allowed us to to play with some explosiveness at that fi- at the uh, fifth starter spot. Uh, he's been averaging 15 uh, a game in his three starts, and then he's been averaging three threes a game uh, in his three starts as well. Uh, that's something that not even Grady Dick did last year. No. Who was a lottery pick? Chris, do you think that if he continues to play like this, he's going to play himself right up into the lottery and then out of the Kansas uh, out of uh, the Kansas team next year. You know what? And that is my only negative with Johnny Furphy. Hey, why can't you do this the last two weeks of the season? Like, let's not do it the whole year. So I only get one year of watching Johnny Furphy basketball because it's fun. It's fun to watch somebody go out there, just throw up threes and they look good. I mean, every shot he takes, I have a lot of confidence in it going in. He's a very fun player to watch. He's a lot of character, a lot of charisma. He's someone that the fan base gets behind just because, hey, he's an Australian kid. He's, he's a young guy. He's kind of really emerged into this, this great. I mean, he's really right now our second, third option. You look at Kevin, Kevin creates more. But if we're looking for a shot down the line, it's either going to be him or Kevin for the most part. Obviously, Hunter can kick some in, but... Those two are people we're going to go into. I think that he, the way he's played offensively, defensively, he's obviously given up some threes. He gave up that really big three against Iowa State there at the end. But I think that, hey, the way that we're trending, obviously we're not to the peak of how we're playing yet. But if he, if this is any indication of how he's going to play down the line, I think he's going to be a huge piece for us in March. I think he's going to be a huge piece for us when we go and still come back and win this Big 12 championship this year and just in the regular season. So that's something I'm very, very high on. The only thing, yeah, as I said before, it's a negative. Can't play this good this early if you want to stay in Lawrence two years. When you're when you're yeah, sitting there I, and you're projected a top 15 pick, you're going to take, I mean, hey, I know NIL is big. Lottery pick contract is fat. But uh, the thing I wanted to talk about is it's great to have that production uh, in that fifth starter spot. But at the same point in time, you still have to get something out of the bench. Uh, yep. Now, now you, you look at the numbers for the bench right now, and, and love those guys to death. And I think they all have the ability to come out there and produce. But right now, it, it hasn't been there. Um, I think that that's something you see. El Marco, a guy that came in with such a high uh, a high projection on where he would go in the draft this next coming year. He was even projected in the lottery in some drafts, and, and and to come play at this level, it can be a shock to some people. Uh, I think we've seen in the past with guys that. It, it took him a second to get adjusted to the to the speed and the physicality of the Big 12. It takes you a second to get adjusted to, to Coach Self's like, playing style, uh, quite honestly. Uh, I think the guys that I think about that succeeded after taking a year or two, it, you think back to CB. Like he, had a, he had a good freshman year. I wouldn't say it was amazing. He, no, he, he came out there. He made, he made some shots. He played, he played solid defense. And you look at guys like, I mean, I think of Quentin Grimes. That's the name that comes comes to mind for me. Is he's somebody that that came out there and, and his freshman year struggled. Uh, I think yeah. back to the game at West Virginia, where you give up a, a slot drive uh, and you're looking around for screens late in the clock. Um, I, I think back to that, and I, I think that that's something where he he's playing. He's an NBA player now. A guy can really go get buckets, but it yep. took him a second. It took him a second to figure out this college level and especially in, in the Big 12. And, and I think you, you hit on all the great points there. And it, like you said, it's a shock. A shock's not the word I would use, but it's a ton and a ton of pressure that we're putting on an 18-year-old. And we're putting on Nick Timberlake, who played at Townsend. I mean, hey, he did, he did a very good job while he was there. He was fantastic while he was there. But you're coming to the University of Kansas. Yeah, he ain't Townsend. Been- they're not in towns anymore. I mean, you want to make two mistakes on the feet on the court and have 40 points. Guess what? Those two mistakes help us lose a game. People are coming at your head. There's a lot of yeah. pressure that goes into that. And there's a lot of maturity that you do have to learn as a player. 
I don't, I'm not losing faith in these guys at all. They'll figure it out. Coach Self is very good at bringing these players to the finish line with them, but then they start contributing. Let's welcome our newest sponsor to the podcast, Shopify. Shopify has brought the cash register online and has helped millions of people sell billions of dollars of merchandise. But did you know that Shopify could help your retail store too? Get a serious upgrade to your point of sales system with Shopify. Shopify's POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing Managing inventory, it has everything you need to sell in person. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify is meant for plug and play from marketing for everything from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is here to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up today for our $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Mitch all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash Mitch, all lowercase. Sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash Mitch. That is all lowercase. Bring your retail store to the next level at shopify.com slash Mitch. We can't wait to see you guys take your retail stores to the next level. And that's why I'm not very worried. It's like, hey, our bench guys aren't complete duds where hey, they, they don't do anything well. They aren't talented enough to be at this level they're very talented they just kind of haven't put it together very hard that, and a lot the of things that i think you need to worry about the things i think you need to worry about is if guys what we consider a cancer like somebody that's going to have a bad attitude and impact the rest of the guys on the team yeah. and i just don't see that and i and from what i've heard from, from no. guys that are still on the team that's not the case with the guys that are are coming off the bench for us right now i think they're all bought in to to what we need to do and and it's going to click I think you saw when when uh, Timberlake was getting rolling against West Virginia. There's there was some confidence. There was some swagger, and, and yep. that's something that if if he can do that and start to to give us more more from that from that six man seven man spot, then then we'll really have a chance to 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 fix this to win some road games because that's going to be the important thing. Like we talked about this a little bit beforehand, we don't get to play each one of these teams home at home mm-hmm. with all these new teams in the Big Twelve. That's that's a big Im- that's a big impact and. That's something that I, I quite I can't I can't imagine in our time there. If you if you lost in the small amount of times we lost games at home, I can't imagine not being able to go get vengeance on the road for getting beat at yeah. home. I, I think that's something that it's it's gonna take some adjusting to, especially for the players. Like yeah. you don't get a chance to, to you don't get a, get a chance to give this team your best shot twice. Like you don't get a chance to, to fall down on the job and then get back up and go punch him in the mouth. Like you're going to have to wait till the big 12 tournament. And and that's something that I don't think any of us want to wait for. I think we want to win the big 12 regular season and we want to win the big 12 tournament, but uh, we're going to have to go out there and we're going to have to handle, handle wins on the handle games on the road. Uh, I, I think back in my head to, to talking to coach Townsend, we were flying private, private jets back from uh, playing in Oklahoma, I think. And we, and we had just yep. got a big win. This might have been my freshman or sophomore year. We just Dude, talking about Nebraska. Game. Nebraska are, are my freshman year sophomore. No, no, no. Year. it was a big. It was a Big Twelve game. I'm, t- I'm thinking of a, there's a Big Twelve game that we played in, but uh, it was it was when we were in, in the conference race. We were, we were we were fighting for a Big Twelve regular season championship, and uh, I was sitting across from KT. And he was sitting there like looking at I don't know if it was a magazine or his phone or something. And he, he puts it down really quickly, looks up at me, and I was like, I thought something was wrong. I was like. He's like, that's how you win the Big 12, right there. Yeah. Got to win on the road. And he just goes back into his thing. I was like, you good? Like, I, I get mm-hmm. it. Like, and I'm a, I'm a young guy at this point in time. Like, I, I knew, obviously, what it meant to to the staff and to the guys there. But it just goes to show you, like, every road game is a chance to to to, to catch up to the people that are in the, in the lead. Or it's a chance to really allow them to, to get some space on you. And there was one point that you didn't mention in there. We're Kansas. We're going to get every team's best shot. So when you go play UCF, I mean, that's the best game that they played. I mean, they ended up beating they ended up beating Texas at Texas. But it's like that's one of the best games they're going to play all year, and we only get one opportunity to go after them. And we don't have the scouting report on them. It's not a scouting report like we have on Texas and Oklahoma and Iowa State and K-State, teams that we've played, and we know exactly what to expect from these teams, the way that they're made up, the way that they're going to guard, the way that they rotate, the way their offense runs. So it is something that, hey, we're going to get the best shot from these guys, and we're kind of going in blind. It, it's a it's a very good thing for us going into tournament season, knowing that, hey, we it's not just a dogfight where we played these teams a thousand times. Coach Self and and um, 
and whoever like the I don't know who the, there's not really that many long tenure coaches in the in the Big Twelve anymore, is there? I'll say it's, kind of, it's kind of crazy from the time from the time that we've been there. You think Bob Huggins is gone? You think I mean even Bruce Weber at, at K State? Bruce Weber. Of, good riddance, dude. Good riddance. Good riddance get the hell out of here. <laughs> get the hell out of here. <laughs> even I mean Shaka, get the hell out of here. Charlie, yeah. who, else, who else was who else was a, a long tenure coach that we, that we played against? I mean Scott Drew. I would say he's the long he's, Kruger. I mean, there's all those guys. I would Scott, say Scott Drew's probably, probably, the, he's, probably the, yeah. he's probably the longest tenure guy outside of, of Coach Self. It's it's that's still in the twelve. Um, obviously, there's Jamie Dixon has been there as long as uh, as long as I've been in in college. Yep. So that that's the, that's probably the other one, but. Uh, I want, you brought up the the UCF Texas game. After that game, there was a bunch of con- controversy going on about horns down and how mad that made Rodney Terry. Uh, I've I've been quoted on this podcast before as just saying how how much I enjoyed watching Rodney Terry and how much I thought he he had done for for Texas last year. Uh, I think yep. he's doing a, he's 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 doing a job this year. Um, I still think that's the softest thing in the world to to go try and coach another man's team. About oh mm-hmm. we don't do that here. That's there is no we. We just kicked your ass in your own building. Like if you're worried about us throwing horns down, then don't lose. Like I think yeah. that is so. Like, in my mind, I think what the hell is going to happen to Texas when they go to the SEC? Like it's gonna, they're going to get mo- they're going to get eaten alive. The fan yeah, I mean, bases they might be crying by the time they step onto the court. Yeah, there, and there there was there was a there was a tweet that came out after that being like, do you think Texas will be able to? to live in the, or to be in the SEC. And it's like the Florida fans or the uh, Florida state fans. And they're the ACC obviously, but before they play Florida, they kill alligators. Auburn one year, Alabama one year killed all of Auburn's like, like the giant trees. trees. They had like the hundred year old trees. They poisoned them. And, and Tennessee is throwing things on the field at players. Like all this stuff is like, okay, when Texas gets there and you're going to be offended by a horns down, how are you going to feel when an Oklahoma state thing happens again, where like they, someone kills a longhorn or something like the people in the South are insane. So I don't Crazy. know how they're going to fare with that. And also with the UCF thing too, it's their first year in the conference. They came down, they came back from what down 18 to get a win yeah. in their building against Texas ever. Like Texas is on Kansas level. We're going to get shit if UCF comes into Lawrence and beats our ass. We're going to get shit, like, just like when we lost yeah, there. 100%. Storm the court. They're all on our players' faces doing whatever. Dude, do you think Coach Self's going to sit there and go talk to the AD and be like, you know how unacceptable that is? No, no one's going to say anything. It, it was a complete joke. It was so soft. And, hey, yeah, if you don't want the horns down to be thrown, then don't lose a game because it's coming. It's coming. They, uh, there was rumors that uh, Texas had talked to the BYU uh, staff about having them – Take, make sure that their student section took their horns down shirts off. Did you see that? There was a there was yeah. a student section. They made them take their horns down shirts off. Like I think that's that's something that is so soft, and that I, I think that it's one of those things where the next game I don't remember who Texas was playing, but uh, not even no, it was Baylor. They had a, they had a game they had a game winner, and uh, Rodney Terry's jumping up and down like swinging his arms like dude like congratulations you won a a regular season game. I thought we don't do that. Like we yeah. act like we, we act like we won a championship. No, you just won a game, and it's currently January. Like I don't understand how. Like it's one of those things where like rules for thee, but not for me. Yeah, don't throw don't throw stones from a glass house. I mean that we've said it a thousand times on here. I think we said it to just about every stupid fan base in the Big Twelve, K State and Texas. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I didn't need the cough. I just said it. But yeah, hey, but let's let's talk a little bit about just kind of what these losses have meant. Kind of, hey, let's talk about the UCF loss. Let's talk about the West Virginia loss. Let's talk about the Iowa State loss. We haven't spent much time on here actually talking about those games and kind of how everything goes. Hand up. Yes, Mitch. Chris, can I go? Yeah, Mitch can go. Uh, I want to talk first off. We talked a little bit about the UCF game when we talked to Parker, and he gave us a little bit of a background, a background on what, what happened there and what went down. I want to move on to the West Virginia game. First off, yeah. we got a big guy in Patrick Sumnick that, that went out there and got 20-plus 20, 20 points and when he's averaging four points a game. That, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a recipe for disaster uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to, to win road games. And then, obviously, uh, they came out there and – both teams are shooting the ball extremely well from the three-point line in the first half. 
but they were able to keep that rolling into the second half where, where the Hawks got cold. Um, and then at the end of the game, the one thing that, that really sticks to my mind, and, and obviously nothing nothing against him, but Johnny Furphy allowing uh, an offensive rebound uh, on a free throw, and then and then again after that on the next shot. So that those are those are things Coach Self has always said this to us. Whereas your season is going to come down to to one rebound or one free throw box out. Uh, yep. For us, it's always prophetically been free throw box out. Like it's there's been seasons that we've had that have been ended by that. Mm-hmm. And obviously, this didn't end our season this year. There's still a lot of, a lot of time left to play. The Hawks are are going to be in the hunt for this. But it's just indicative of he's a young guy. He he's only been here for a little bit. Granted, he's playing great. There are things that you got to fix if you want to be if you want to if you want to win the Big Twelve. Yeah. Oh no, for sure. And I look. I mean, so West Virginia is obviously a very very concerning loss. I think that the most concerning loss, obviously UCF, just because we scored only sixty points. If we're going to be a good defensive team and hold teams to sixty five points, then we can't lose those games. We can't do it. West Virginia is very concerning for two things. We let them shoot 57% from three, which, as you said, hey, there's going to be teams that just get hot against us. It's, it's been, it's been it going It feels like, like it that. always happens to us. It feels it like there's just, it, there's just guys that can't shoot, and then they play against Kansas, and then the, the ghost of Stephen, uh, Steph Curry goes into, the, into their body, and they're, they're shooting well, from they're, everywhere. <laughs> they're shooting from everywhere, contested threes. I mean, you're looking – I mean, yeah, it's just ridiculous, and they, they get hot. And then also with the West Virginia game, we got out-rebounded by nine. We got out-rebounded by four on the offensive end and five on the defensive end. And I think that's kind of what we've looked at over the last couple games anyways. Cincinnati, the reason why that game was so close, we had a very hard time boxing those guys out. Hunter's not the most athletic guy. He can grab anything that comes into his reach. KJ is an undersized guy. He doesn't get as many rebounds as I think he should. And Johnny's been rebounding the ball very well. But as we pointed out, offensive or defensively, he's had a hard time finding his man in big time moments, which, hey, those guys want it. They want it really bad. You look at the Oklahoma State team from what, 2019, 2017, 2018, when we lost to him twice. I yeah. mean, those dudes, those dudes, you want to talk about crashing the glass. They didn't play offense. They just had their two guys go up there and shoot a three. And then their McGriff and those big boys just would be like, hey, Dalton. I see the back of your I see the back of your head right now. I'm gonna put a shoulder into it. I'm gonna jump as high as I can and go get it. Yeah. And so yeah, I think that I think rebounding's been a big thing. I think three pointers have been a big thing. We're not gonna win a game when we allow the other team to score above 90 points. I'm just gonna let everyone here know that unless it goes into quadruple overtime. Those aren't games that we're going to win. That's not how our team's made up. Parker alluded to it early on when we talked to him the other week. I mean, it's it's one of those things where we just got we got to be better defensive. We got to be flying around more. Hey, if they make if they shoot like they did against West Virginia and every one of those are contested threes, then guess what? We meant to lose that game. I feel like a lot of the time we haven't contested them up to what we should be contesting these threes at, and it's very frustrating for me as a player, as a former player, to kind of watch that, knowing that we've had these same exact struggles all throughout the last, what, eight, nine years. Chris, moving on now, I want to talk a little bit about the Iowa State game. Uh, I, want to, I want to jump in next to the whole uh, phone behind the bench, staff behind the bench at the Iowa State-Kansas State game. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But first, the Iowa State game, playing in Hilton, we can, we can both attest to this. It's a wild environment. It's got the Hilton magic. No. Everyone says, like, yeah, I agree with this, but the fog is different. Hilton also has, yeah, I would say this, it's a second place in the Big 12 for being special. Uh, the place is oh, loud. Wow. The, found, the, the fans are rowdy. Uh, they're, the fans are I mean. The, some the of my fans favorite do their teams, research. Yeah, they, they're, they're rowdy. They do their research, and, and they'll let you hear it, too. Like I, I remember being up there, and like you can't argue a single call without getting, hey, Mitch, shit your ass down. You're out, yeah. get, out, get your ass off the bench. Like. Stuff like that is just something that happens up there. They're going to let you know. And, and I think that looking at that game, I think the Hawks, we, ha- we have to do more on the defensive end. We have to do more on the defensive yeah. end. We, ha- we, have to, we have to be better. Uh, I think Hunter has to be better. I think he has to, 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 to plug space. Even if you're not going to block shots, you just got to take up space. Be, be, be the seven foot two guy you are and, and mm-hmm. be intimidating when people are going to the hoop. We talked about this when Pollard was on the pod. Uh, when you're seven foot two, you have to impact around the hoop. Even if you're not jumping and yep. having a forty inch vert to block shots, you got you just got to be big. And and that's something that I couldn't. I mean, I, I I tried to jump and block shots. 
Hunter could stand there and reach damn near as high as I could when I jumped. Yep. Like that's something that I think we need to get better at. I think people looked at looked at Juan and they think, oh, why isn't he giving us 15 points? Like that's not Juan's game. He, he's not he's not going out there to try and score 20 points. He's not going out there to to get him up. He's going out there to get everybody involved. And, mm-hmm. and I saw I saw tweets on Twitter about oh when are we going to start to to recruit Juan's competition so he can have competition on. I think people are so spoiled. Dewan Harris does so much for our team. He gets so many people involved. Like we literally just got over, we just got over the facts talking about like on KU's Twitter with Dewan Harris makes pro wings. You think Ochai, you think Christian, you think Grady, you think soon to be Kevin, you think J. Will, soon to be Furphy. Yep. Even KJ has a chance. Like, like guys like that. Like, I, I think it's wild to me that that, that people are are questioning how much are questioning Dewan and, and saying that maybe we need to bring in someone that that uh, can challenge him for his for his minutes. It's completely ludicrous. What do you think? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. We're complaining about a guy, as we said before we got on this podcast, that's averaging eight, seven, and four with averaging probably one turnover a game. And that's who we're complaining about. Eight, seven, and four is a winning point guards. That's a winning, that's a winning team point guard position. Maybe in college quick, it can be a little quick different. Quick check, quick check, quick check. Seven, seven, and two with 1.7 steals. Okay, yeah. and That's I mean, almost better. Seven, seven, and two, and one like over one and a half steals a game. Like, what? It, that's what you want. I mean, that's like outside of Devonte, outside of Frank, the and outside of Sharon. That has been our point guard. That's been Kansas basketball point guard for the last two decades. Russ Literally, Rob. Had, Russ Rob. I mean, he's going down as an all time great. I don't think people really remember. They kind of think Mario was the point guard. Mario was the two guard on that team. But also, you're going to talk about, hey, why don't we start recruiting some guys to get some competition for DeWan? We already did that. We got Remy Martin, a guy who helped us win a national championship. And he never beat Juan out for his spot. And Remy was a great, a fantastic basketball player. Love Remy. Remy, I have no ill words to say about him. But, dude, Juan's going to give you the same thing every single night. He's going to make the team better. And everyone wants to see the natural progression of a player, which usually is coming in, playing good defense, controlling the ball, making those winning plays. And then you really look at it, most of these players end up making that jump to scoring. Juan is so good at these other things that that jump to scoring doesn't need to happen. And that's not who Juan is. I've all, everyone asks me about Juan. If you put Juan in a high school basketball game, you put Juan in a Division three basketball game, put Juan in a D1 college basketball game, or put Juan in the NBA, you're going to get the same thing out of him. And he's going to control the game the same way. He's played yeah. so much basketball. That's the only way he knows how to play, and he does a fantastic job of it. I would, I, we've had this conversation three or four times on here, but yeah, hey, you guys got to get off his back. I mean, he does everything that we need him to do to win. I know there's a stat out there that we're eighteen and one or nineteen and one when he scores over ten points, but also look at the other games where he scores less than ten points. His record at Kansas, he's only lost like ten games. So, like, it's something that we all need to just take a step back. Let him do those things. I think Hunter's another another thing where it's like, hey, yeah, we want him to be better on defense. But there's a lot of blame that can be spread around everybody. You can look at the way that Kevin's been guarding lately. You can look at the way that Johnny's been guarding. Look at the way that Hunter, he got up to the ball screens to start the year. When we played TCU, he was up on the ball screens. He got up to everything. He's just been a little late reacting. I think that comes from an overload of minutes because our bench hasn't been producing that much. Parker's obviously played great. I would like to see his minutes up a little bit more. Iowa State played a huge lineup that was very, very physical. I mean, they beat the living crap out of Hunter. So you think when they get the last five minutes of the game, he's going to be sitting there ready to jump doing that? It's like, no, he's been getting his thighs destroyed by people's knees and butts and whatever they are, trying to make sure he stays off the glass, make sure he doesn't have a clean look. So something I think we put more on the guards and having them fly around by also – Hey, like, we'll help you out, big fella, but you just need to give us a second. You need to give us a second where you're up to the level of the ball so we can get in front of the guy and we don't give him these threes where they can take one dribble and kind of get some rhythm. The rhythm dribble is what kill us. You want, look at the Baylor teams over the last five years. Those guys, all they wanted to do was get into their rhythm dribbles. And if they saw you on your toes, they were going to go by you. If they saw you on your heels, 
they were going to sit there and they're going to pull up and shoot. And that's almost a 60% shot for most of those guys. Yeah. So I think it's something about, hey, being active and showing one thing, but also being reactive and being turned up enough that you sh- that you do another thing and kind of cause havoc. I think that's something that we've been lacking over these last couple of games. It's shown in the ability of these guys to shoot threes and the high percentage that they've been shooting. Yeah, Chris, we, we talked about Iowa State. I want to keep the topic on them a little bit and, and go towards the Kansas State-Iowa State game where we had the Connor Stallions from Iowa mm-hmm. State where it actually turns out that that they're vehemently denying the fact that, that anybody had anything to do with recording plays and texting into their huddle. Like, in, in my honest opinion, I think Kansas State is overreacting so much. What do you think? I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Hey, there may be some kind of sign stealing. Hey, but also you're playing basketball. There's 10 guys on the court. If Juan's walking down the walking down the court going like this, going like this or going like this or whatever, that's all name calls a place. They're going to see that in film. But also we're going to sit there and freak out about this. Oh, he's taking videos and texting them to the huddle for them to watch. I know how phones work in Chris, those arenas. I think he's just, they don't I work think, like that. I literally think he's a fan. Fans are on he their phones. Was, he but, probably was a fan. But also, there's going to be so many camera angles. If he's texting someone in the Iowa State huddle, there's going to be someone in the Iowa State huddle at all times like this. He's going to be on his phone looking and being like, hey, like, look here, look here. There was not at any point any video evidence of that happening. I can understand that maybe he maybe we got the story wrong and he was mad about the fans sitting there giving him the boo-hoo, crying, jumping around. I think that's a little bit over exaggeration. Mike Vernon actually wrote a little article kind of on what happened with us at one point. I mean, there was a guy behind our bench that was in K State, K State clothes, and he was looking over the bench. Did he look like he was a staffer? No, because he would never have gotten close if he was a staffer. That would be called that call out for a brawl. It was probably a dumbass fan that was like, "Oh, I'm sitting next to the bench. Like, I kind of want to hear what they say in a in a huddle." And did that. Tang obviously didn't like it. There's a lot of things that happened down the line of that that kind of caused this to gain some traction. But I don't think it's any. I think everyone's overreacting. Yeah, and then TJ Altselberger came out and said that uh, one of their student managers got cussed out by by a K State assistant coach. Like that's. That's a really bad look, if you ask me. Um, we, we have a guy that's wiping the sweat off the floor to make sure everybody can, can play safe and that your guys have the ability to go out there and, and play safely, and you're going to cuss them out. Like That, that, that to me, shows a, a lack of class, and, and I think that that's something that needs to, be, needs to be addressed and needs to be fixed because student managers do so much for the game, uh, regardless of if they're at your school or not. They, they do so much, and uh, that's somebody that deserves a little respect. And, and yeah, hey, and like they're probably getting mad at them for being too close to the huddle. Just like to back to what I just said, texting, if you're texting another coach on the other team, someone's going to be like, okay, why is that coach on his phone the whole time being like, look at this, look at this? That would be illegal. The refs would have seen it. The TV would have seen it. Everyone would have seen it. I don't think there's anything to really look into or read in there. I think everybody lately has just kind of been on the train that, hey, if we lose, we got to make excuses. I think Kansas fans did that against West Virginia. I mean, we're still looking at replays of all that, that El Marco steal. But I think it's just everyone has to have an excuse after these losses instead of looking at themselves and being like, hey, this is what happened. I think KU as a team does that very well. I think our fans don't do it as well, which is very, very understandable. But let's that brought up an interesting point, Mitch. Let's talk about the current state of the refs in the Big 12. I'm not talking – for just Kansas, I'm not talking for us against Iowa State. I'm talking in general. Do you think that the games have become so competitive and so high-paced and so athletic lately that these refs are just weighing over their head? Because that's my opinion. I mean, go turn on a game. Go turn on the big Monday game tonight. It'll probably be a shit show. Okay. I, th- I, In my honest opinion, I think that the Big 12 is a physical league. They need to be allowed to yep. play physical up into, the, up into the point where it impedes their ability to make a basketball play. If you're two big guys in the Big 12 and you're trying to get post position, you should be allowed to jockey for position. You should be able to, when a guy's trying to back you down, use your forearm, stop him from backing down. If, if, yep. if you're driving into the lane and you're going up for a, for a shot and somebody's smacking your arms, obviously clearly a foul. Uh, I, the one play I think back to is uh, it's K-State, Iowa State. Uh, one of the guards on, on K-State uh, jams the ball and goes to, goes to try and make a play on the ball. And the ref, you literally see his face... Yeah, like look off into the crowd. 
as Jinx. the Iowa State guy bops them in the mouth with an elbow, like stuff like that. I mean, it's that's so like it happens one every thousand calls. Like, yeah, it's not gonna happen. Like, refs are people too. Like, refs are getting yelled at by fans. Like, you make eye contact with people. Like, it's unfortunate that the, the guy had to get elbowed right there, but at the same point in time, that play has happened a million times and there, there's been fouls called on it before and there's going to be fouls missed on it again. Um, I yeah. think that, I think that the big 12 should be physical. They should let some things go, but at the same point in time, if it's impacting winning and losing, then they, they have to make sure that, that they're, uh, that they're more locked into it. Um, I hate to be a guy that complains about the refs. I think that's something that yeah. I mean, coach self has taught us that like, that's their job. Let him worry about that. We need to, to go out there and, and control. We can control. And, and if the Hawks can go out there and, and make sure we're defensively rebounding, and if we can go out there and make sure we're not turning the ball over, if we can go out there and make sure we're, we're running people off the line, then we're going to have a better chance to win. We can't sit here and, and worry about what the refs are doing. Yeah, and like you look back at the West Virginia game, that, that steal on a Marco that was called a foul, yeah, hey, that was a very pivotal moment of the game, and it gave us an opportunity to make it a closer one. But let's look at all the plays that we made that we shouldn't have made or that we allowed them to make. There were probably 15 to 20 points out on the floor that we should have made. Obviously, you, you're not going to be perfect, but it's like that that call obviously changed the game in that aspect in that very Chris. moment. But everything Chris. in the first half of that game, everything in the second half of that game coming up to that moment played a pivotal, pivotal part in things that we can control. Chris, do you think coaches out there saying to the guys that practice after we get done at West Virginia – Oh wow, we mean great play, El Marco. Like that ref really screwed us. Or is he saying, "Damn, we have to learn how to defensively rebound and make sure we don't give up three offensive rebounds in the last two minutes?" The last of the game? Two minutes. Yeah, I, like, I think you're exactly right. I think that, I mean he probably told El Marco, "Hey, that was a great play. You didn't foul him there." But that was probably the extent of the conversation about that foul call. He's going to turn all like, of his attention right to the defensive rebound. Right to the defensive rebound. Hey, we got out rebounded on both ends of the floor. Hey, we let them shoot 57% from three on an abysmal three point shooting team. We allowed them to get comfortable early in the game. We allowed them to get confidence early, early in the game. That is something that I think a lot of people don't understand is you're playing those teams that have a lot of talent. There's not one team in the Big 12 that doesn't have top 25 talent, but are they able to put it together in a way that allows them to be top 25? And the answer is no. But, hey, you let them get in the game. You let them hit two threes to start. You let them get into their flow offensively. You're not making it hard for them to catch. That allows them to gain confidence. And they remember, hey, yes, I'm still a four-star recruit. That was got offers from Kansas and Kansas State when I ended up going to West Virginia. I think it's something about, hey, we aren't putting up pressure on these bad teams and trying to blow them out of the water early. And we we did a good job. I mean, we, we did it against UCF. We did it against West Virginia. We got on these runs to start the game. And then we got complacent being like, yeah, they're 6-11 and 11 team. We're just going to beat their brakes in after this. But in reality, it's like, no, we got to turn it up. And then when it's a 30-point game going into halftime and these guys' heads are hung and they're walking the locker room like, damn, this game's already over, then you maybe call off the dogs a little bit and just still have that energy. I think it has a lot to do with just setting the tone early, letting these dudes know that, hey, you can't play with us and we're not even going to let you think for any part of this 40 minutes that you're going to be allowed to play with the Kansas Jayhawks. Okay, well, we've, we've, we've hit about every single point that we can think of as former players knowing what's kind of going on inside the locker room right now for Kansas during this skit. We play Oklahoma State next, and I'm sure that the confidence level isn't very high. But, Mitch, how would you list off our next, what, eight or nine games after this Oklahoma State game, which we are, hey, don't be wrong, we already blew them out of the gym at Oklahoma State, but they're still a good team that can put together a good game. What are we looking like after that Oklahoma State game? First off, obviously, I think you have to use the Oklahoma State game to build confidence, to, to mm -hmm. make sure you get everybody rolling in the right direction. This is a great warm-up for a wild end to our season. Wild. I'm, I'm going I'm to list, I'm I'm list these off here for you. You have number four-ranked Houston, Kansas State, <laughs> who has played well this year. Kansas State has played well. They can beat anybody. Number 18, number 18 Baylor. Number 15, Texas Tech. Number 23, Oklahoma, Texas. Texas can beat anybody. Texas is always talented. good. Very talented team. This put Number it 22, BYU. Number 18, Baylor, Kansas State. Number four, Houston, to end it. That is a, like, 
at what point in time do we just say the Big 12 is a gauntlet and everybody you play is going to be good? And that, that is the crazy be a, part. It's do, <laughs> you're duking it out every night against a top 20 ranked team. like And teams that, that will, like, I mean, hey, I think K-State right now is like, obviously they, they got smoked by Houston. But, dude, they're looking like they're going to get into the tournament. Texas is another team. I mean, they have Hunter. They have Hunter. They have uh, – is Abrams there too still? Like they have Abrams. Ab- yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, you think about that. Those teams have chances to be ranked by the time we play them. Like, yeah, and, and Texas, a, gauntlet, a gauntlet's three or four games. That is nine games. That is – we're not even the halfway point through the Big 12 season, and the rest of our schedule is a gauntlet. Chris, I want to ask you, what do you think – are the three things we have to make sure we do if we're going to go into that stretch and give ourselves a chance to win the Big 12? I think it first comes with what we were just talking about, setting the tone early, not letting these guys get comfortable. Hey, if, if we don't let them get comfortable, they're obviously going to be sitting there working for everything. They're going to get tired down. Those last five minutes of that game are going to be a lot harder for those starters if we let them know early you're going to have to work for everything. I think that also kind of plays into the fact that we need more protection from our bench because, hey, we can't have Kevin and Hunter and KJ and Dewan and Johnny out there at all times. Simply for the fact that we, game. Yeah, we, got, we have to be able to force the issue a little bit more and make sure our guys are fresh so when they do come in, hey, you're not going to catch the ball in the scoring area. We're not going to let you do that. That's what all great Kansas teams have done. I think there's going to be a huge emphasis this week on rebounding defensively and offensively, making sure, hey, like we need to have guys be there to grab the rebound, but we haven't done a good job of putting bodies on these guys. Teams like Houston, UCF, Iowa State, uh, Oklahoma is another team. They have a bunch of big wings. They've adopted the Kansas mentality that we've kind of beat down the Big 12 with being like, hey, we're going to have three guys that can go there and go get 10 rebounds a night, four guys that go get 10 rebounds a night. So I think that's another thing that we look at. I think the third thing also is playing defensively as a group better. We're playing behind. They're playing behind us being a step slow a lot of the time. You play a step slow with help and you pass the ball three times. That equals three steps. So that three steps makes a huge difference when someone who, who's a shooter gets the ball in the corner. They're going to be able to take that second, step into their rhythm, get the shot off with a clean look. So I think those are the three things that are major that we're going to kind of look at over this next week, two weeks, however long you want to say it, as we're rebuilding our team to make sure that we can go through this gauntlet. So, I mean, you, do you agree with that one? I, I think the biggest thing that you said there, like obviously – we need to make sure we're 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 beating one and a half men every time on one and a half men every time on defense. Uh, yep. But the big thing is we have to have production from the bench. Like yep. there has to be. I mean, I think production is the wrong word. You have to be serviceable. Yeah, service coach self has yep. to have, coach self has to have confidence in you defensively to put you in the game. He yep. he cares much less about offense as as he does about defense. Like if he if he puts you out there and you and you give up two baskets in an offensive rebound, and I can, from experience, I can promise you he is going to sub you out no matter if you've been in the game for 12 seconds or 10 minutes. You are yep. sitting your ass down next to Prashard on the bench. Like yep. I, I think that that's something that, that we need to make sure that, that we get from our bench. Uh, strictly from a, like we said, that is a gaunt, that not even a gauntlet. That is just a brutal end brutal. to our schedule. Like, we have to make sure... Those guys aren't their bodies aren't destroyed by the time we get to that last Houston game. Like they're, they're, there's a real, real chance if our bench doesn't step up, you're having three or four guys average 37 minutes a game. Like yeah. crazy stuff. Some crazy things, and I think we saw it last year with the Big 12 in general. Last year, the Big 12 was a gauntlet again, and when we got to tournament time, those Big 12 teams did not produce in the way they should have produced. And I think it's simply because of the fact that it was a war. And every, we beat the crap out of each other every oh single God. night. Every night. So you're getting to March, the teams that are deep, the teams that you look at UConn, like they're not going to have every game is going to be a great game. So when they came into March, they looked fresh. They looked like they were more, more in shape. They looked like they were stronger, physically stronger, just more mentally sharp. They weren't worn down. So I think it's something we have to have those bench production to do that. And I think you made a great point where they have to be serviceable. I think you watch El Marco come in. I think you watch Nick come in. And the first thing they're doing is like, hey, I have to get some confidence going. And they're looking for it on the offensive end. They're getting the ball. El Marco's immediately slot driving. Understanding the slot drive. 
But hey, we should be focused on the defensive end. Get your hand on the ball a couple times. Get a rebound. Take it up to court. When you get that feel for the game, and then it's like, hey, I have a three-point shot. I can get up and shoot it. You do that for four minutes, they're going to play for four minutes. Think about Chris, the amount of the comfort you get from four minutes instead of a minute in your first shot and then being taken out. What confidence does Coach have to put you back in? What confidence do you have in yourself after being put in and being taken out within a minute of each other? Chris, going back to what you said about how much the Big 12 can wear on you and how that impacted us, impacted the Big 12 as a whole in, in March Madness last year, I, I think back to, to the year we won it all. Like, granted, we, we played great. We, we ended up winning the whole thing. But going into the, big, the March Madness, we were not healthy all yeah. thing, uh, pretty much across the board. Yeah. Like what people know about, they knew about how Dave was dealing with his foot. I had my knee that was, that was bothering me, but like there's other guys on our team that were fighting injuries all year, like stuff that they had been bothering them for weeks. Like mm-hmm. th- it, this is something that you have to make sure you have a deep enough, a deep enough roster to where you can get guys like, Hey, instead of playing, instead of playing Oach, 40 minutes tonight, we're going to play Oach 30, 31 minutes tonight. And we're going to, we're going to give yeah. J. Cole some more reps and allow him to, to, to get some confidence. Like that's something where like, if, if we can have Nick Timberlake get out there and, and, and allow DeWan to, to, to get, get some break, get a break or, or allow Kevin to get a break. Like, yeah, it's going to, it's going to pay dividends for us more than just having production off the bench. And I think you can, I think you'll agree with me on this point. It's a lot more energizing for a guy like Nick Timberlake or El Marco to come off the bench and create, and, and Jamari to create three big plays than it is for a Kevin or a KJ to create three big plays. Oh, so the it, it pumps energy, energy, energy level. It pumps energy in the room. You, you want to see that. The guys on the bench who are watching that are going to get a thousand times more hype if Nick comes in and hits two threes and gets a steal, gets a stop, gets a, gets a charge, whatever it may be on that defensive end. That is going to propel us a whole lot more than it is, hey, Juan gets a steal and hits a three. Like, no, it's like those guys are going to be a very big spark, spark for us. I think Remy Martin's a perfect example of that. When Remy did something, it was like – we could have been down 30. If Remy Martin hits a step back three, we're like, okay, here we go. Like, here we go. Here we go. Game. But we're think, in the about game. It, think about it from like the other team's point of view as well. Like they're used to, to Kevin coming out there and knocking down a three. They're used to, to Hunter getting another another offensive rebound in a bucket. Like they're used to KJ dunking it. But like if imagine if we can get Timberlake out there or we can get a Marco out there. I mean, Parker, like guys like that, if they go out there and get you, hey, I get a put back. I get a jump hook and I and Nick knocks down a three. Like those are stuff that is backbreaking for other teams that are they're prepared to guard Kevin and, and let him get eighteen. They're not prepared for for Nick Timberlake to come out there and get twelve or go get eight. Yeah. And then you have Parker with four. Like stuff like that breaks the will of the other team. Breaks the will of the other team. And then think about we're probably averaging what, 65, 70 points a game, and Nick Timberlake's averaging three points. So you add nine points to that if he has 12 points, then we're averaging 74, 75, whatever the number may be. And, and this, is not, this is not us saying that, that Nick needs to average 12 no, points no, no. a game. We're just saying that there, there should be games, like big games in this next big stretch that we have, yeah. where, where Nick can come out there and give us something that the other team is not prepared for that will give us a great chance to win. A great chance to win. And I like it is very hard for me to say this, but it's like I think Kevin averages what 17 right now, 18 right now. I don't remember. He he definitely has dropped down a little bit from his 20s. But him having 25 or him having 30 isn't as big for us as a team as Nick having a 12, a 10, or El Marco coming in and having eight. It's not as big for the team as it is because hey, you're still using Kevin, 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 Kevin. But then you allow him to have those opportunities later on in the game where they're having to play off of Make sure that Nick's not getting another shot, and then you let our best shooter, our most clutch player, our most our most elder player, be able to be in those big positions where you still have to focus on these other guys. It opens up a ton of opportunity for everybody. I think I think that that's something that we will see here soon. I'm very excited to see that. I think that this last game was a wake up call. But let's talk. Let's talk one last thing before we get out of here. Let's talk about what do you think Coach Self is addressing right now? We're not talking about hey, we need to do this better. What is he addressing psychologically with these players right now? Do you think that he is 
on their butts being like, we're awful? Or do you think he's building us up saying, hey, these games were, were closer than you think. There's just some few things that we need to tighten up. What do you think the inside that locker right now coming from Coach Self's looking like? Chris, I, I know I, I, people watching this probably want me to say, oh, he's building them up and, and, and he's saying, oh, this will be okay and whatnot. But I think Coach Self is probably being – hard-nosed coach stuff that we're used to. I think he's he's yep. probably telling those guys, like, hey, this is Kansas. Like, winning the Big 12 is what we do. Like, it's time for you to, to figure it out on defense. It's time, to you, time for you to take the next step toughness-wise in order for us to, to go out there and make sure we handle business in this stretch. Um, I, I think there's no gimmies. There's no gimmies mm. in the Big 12. There's not, uh, one, even not if, one left for sure. There's not one it, left for it, sure. Even Oklahoma State, not a gimme. Like, the, we, no. we've... We've been humbled by Oklahoma State in the past. So I, I think guys. Coach Self is, is making sure that these guys feel the feel the pressure and and feel the uh the the almost will the willpower that he's he has for us to be good because he's gonna coach his ass off and, and it's up to our guys to 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 make sure that they can do what, what he wants us to do. I think you're I think you're spot on with that. I think he's gonna sit there, he's gonna be very hard on these guys. He's not gonna let them slack off and practice anymore. I mean not slack off, but you know, he's going to be watching every little detail. He's gonna stop practice if Johnny Furphy doesn't go put a body on someone as soon as that ball goes up. He's gonna be very, very attention to detail type thing. No letting these people know, letting our team know that hey, we're not that far, but these little things mean so, so, so much. It's I think still this is really until yeah. Houston, it'll, and I think you'll agree with this because it's happened so many times with these hard losses. Oklahoma State's a game at home. It's not that big of a game. It's not something to get your feet up on. If we play decent in that game, nothing's going to happen. If we lose that game, obviously he's going to be freaking out. But he's going to be hard on them up until Friday. And that Friday practice before we play Houston in Allen Fieldhouse, he will start building the guys back up again, being like, he'll. Well, it doesn't matter how they practice on Friday. You're he's so great, up. stud. You guys are great. This is the best practice we have all year. I can't wait to go out there tomorrow. He's going to do that. He's going to make you feel like you're at the bottom of the earth, like you're going to feel down in the Grand Canyon at the very bottom of that bad boy. But and then when Friday you comes, up. you're going to be a hundred. You're going to be a hundred miles above sea level. I think that is. I think that's kind of how this is going to go. And I'm really excited to watch our first. I don't want to. I don't want to say this because I want us to be focused, focused for Oklahoma State. But I think Saturday will be a huge, huge matchup, and I think it will tell a lot about how this year is going to go and if we have the capability to bounce back from these losses because this is definitely not the last one. Hopefully there's not too many more after this, but can we be able to bounce back in these moments? I think that will tell a lot about us going into March. Are we going to be able to come back from halftime deficits? I think this this next week will be a lot. I would really love to be a fly on the wall in, that, in Allen Fieldhouse while these teams are practicing this week. Well, awesome, Chris. I, I really appreciate you jumping on here today. Uh, obviously, we uh, we do this a lot, but uh, it really means means a lot to me to have a, a co-host like yourself and a best friend like yourself. Uh, I really do appreciate you. Uh, to everybody watching, uh, Chris and I, this means so much to us that you guys tune in and, and listen to our podcast. Uh, dry, drop a like, a subscribe, uh, turn on your notifications, and uh, keep up with uh, keep up with Chris and Mitch. Uh, this has been another episode of Rock Chalk Unplugged. See you guys. Rock Chalk.